This episode is sponsored by Rekwatchers. Stay tuned until the end of the video to discover how you can save 40% on their RJM collection where each watch contains a piece of a vintage World War II fighter aircraft. Today I want to introduce you to a very special project, that being the restoration of a World War II warboard with a very fascinating story. This is PT-879, flying for the first time since May 1945. As a Spitfire Mark IX, she was built in 1944 at Castle Bromwich. And this might not sound that special. After all, many Spitfires were built at that facility. But that is not where the story ends. PT-879 did not serve with the RAF or in Europe. But she was sent to the Soviet Union alongside over 1,300 Spitfires to support the Soviet Union in their battles on the Eastern Front. 1,300 is a lot of aircraft. So the question surely is, where are these aircraft? Some of them must have survived. Well, sadly no. Combat, accidents, scrapping and time have taken its toll and of all the Spitfires leaving Britain, not a single one has come back. Except one. PT-879 was located in 1977 in Murmansk and after some back and fro with the locals, made its way back. It didn't look like much, but that's not going to stop some people from bringing it back to life. I have a great passion for vintage aeroplanes. It's something that's been a big part of my life for the last 20 years. The shape, the sound, the feel of a Spitfire is very exceptional. And uh, any pilot that's been involved in flying a Spitfire, it's an aeroplane that you don't fly. You, you kind of think it through the sky. You know, you want to make a turn and it, it turns. It's the most wonderfully balanced, harmonized aeroplane. Very, very special. That was Peter Teichmann of the Hangar 11 collection based in Essex, UK. And he's the pilot and owner of PT-879, who over the last years has not just funded the restoration of the aircraft, but he is also about to take it back into the sky. I was going to meet Peter Teichmann and PT-879 and film it in its restored state, but sadly, current COVID-19 restrictions mean, of course, that that isn't possible. Today, I want to introduce you to that story. But to do that, I need to explain to you how PT-879 ended up in the Soviet Union. Spitfires, alongside many other British and American aircraft, were of course sent over to the Soviet Union as part of the Lend-Lease program in World War II. You might in fact remember the video I made about Soviet Spitfires. In that video, I largely talked about the first real notable shipment of 150 Spitfire Mark V's, which were greeted with, let's say, mixed feelings by Soviet pilots in 1943. My focus back then was on a rather small pool of aircraft and their use and deployment on the Eastern Front. However, there was a larger shipment of over 1,100 Spitfire Mark IX in 1944 and occasional reconnaissance Mark IVs sent over there as well. And these received a much more favorable reception, so I want to talk to you about these today. A good example actually can be found uh, about the early reconnaissance Spitfires with the experiences of the pilots of the 118th Independent Reconnaissance Air Regiments, which uh, flew actually different Soviet and Western aircraft, so they were well placed to compare these. The Spitfire was deemed the best single-engine reconnaissance aircraft in comparison to the modified Yak-1s, Lark-3, Hurricanes, Aero Cobras and Kitty Hawks. When the Spitfire Mark IX arrived in 1944, it was put through some very thorough testing. The test showed that the aircraft, with a powerful altitude engine, boasted a much greater service ceiling than that of any mass-manufactured Soviet fighter. The British fighter also exceeded them in terms of climbing ability and power of armament. The equipment which was installed on the Spitfire distinguished it to its advantage as well. However, at low and medium altitudes, the LF-9 was considerably behind the up-to-date Soviet fighters. I find this to be quite interesting, as the Soviets received almost exclusively the LF variants of the Mark IX, which was in fact optimized for low altitudes. 
but nevertheless it was just to be less promising to the up-and-coming Soviet planes starting to roll out of the factories at that time. But, but at the same time its advantages in climb, altitude and firepower made it a perfect fit for something the Soviets did not have enough. And that was high altitude air defense. In this role it saw service over Leningrad for example, which was constantly being visited and harassed by German reconnaissance aircraft. There are things that the Spitfire did for the Soviets that are also often forgotten. First off, it stayed in service until as late as 1951, which is longer than many other Western aircraft that were sent there. Also, the Spitfire's engine, the Rolls-Royce Merlin, was of course tested and analyzed by Soviet engineers. However, naturally, the shift to jet engines following World War II sort of concluded this research. Talking about jets though, the Spitfire found itself in a very unlikely role. The Mark 9s the Soviet Union received were so important as training tools in the period following the war that some of them were converted to two-seater variants to train new up-and-coming jet pilots and to test new equipment. The Spitfire played an important role during the post-war years as a high-altitude training fighter. Pilots practiced high-altitude flying in the Spitfires before the conversion to jet fighters. In the case of the Spitfire 9 UTI, the second seat was submerged in the rear fuselage behind the first and was topped with a normal Spitfire canopy. The existence of this trainer version was unknown in the West for many years. Eventually, however, the aircraft were phased out, scrap, or simply lost to time. All but one. PT-879 was uh, produced at Vickers Armstrong at Castle Bromwich uh, in the summer of 1944, and then she was shipped as part of Lend-Lease to a Russian squadron. From the spring of 1945, there was a dogfight, she crushed on the tundra, but we understand that a, a capitalist, socialist Russian farmer recovered this entire aeroplane. So we have a crashed aeroplane, complete, with the engine, with the prop, wings, fuselage, everything. And so a lot of Spitfires, a lot of Hurricanes went out and none have come back. This is the only one. A restoration like this, well, it's both as complicated as it is a labor of love. The airframe of PT-879 was restored by the airframe assemblies on the Isle of Wight, taking three years between 2011 and 2014, utilizing hundreds of original parts from the aircraft that were cleaned and reused as wartime original parts. As well as that, the uh, engine had of course to be restored. And in the meantime, a lot of additional spare parts had to be found or rebuilt until the aircraft actually arrived at the Biggin Hill Heritage Hangar for the final restoration in 2018. It's our intention to put as many pieces of the original aeroplane into PT-879 to make it a really unique restoration. All in working order. Some parts we'll restore and we'll be able to recover. Other parts we will have to replace with original. Again, look here. Oops. The original roundels here. So we know that the RAF roundel would have been overpainted with some green paint by hand and then a star would have been brushed on like that. And that's exactly how she was. There's the battery box door with the eight from the 879. This is the Hisuza Spania cannon and as you can see it's an incredibly powerful bit of kit. So just the other week, 75 years on, I happened to turn this and there was a still had air pressure in it, just amazing. Ready to go. So again it's a, it's a, a big labour of love which will take uh, quite a number of years to achieve.
After lots of labor, love and sweat, PT-879 is close to fully restored. Bearing her original Soviet colors of the 767th Fighter Aviation Regiment, the aircraft is now one of the few remaining flying warbirds from World War II, which is really just so an exciting moment because the history and the restoration of this aircraft is just remarkable. And there are not a lot of planes left from that time period that are flying today. So each and every one of them is precious. And that brings me to another special announcement. You can actually own a piece of PT-879 and at the same time support the restoration and also the ongoing maintenance on the aircraft. Rekwatches, the sponsor of today's episode, partnered with Peter Teichmann some time ago. And their RJM watch collection, well, this is really special, to be honest. It's not just inspired by the Spitfire, but every single watch also has a piece of PT-879 inside of it, which is prominently displayed on the day dial. Pieces of this will be going inside each watch. So a piece of PT-879 uh, with every one, which is exciting and romantic. I think this is an absolutely unique concept. So when this video will come out, you will get an exclusive 24-hour advanced access to the Black Friday sale by following the link in the description below and entering PT-879 on checkout to receive a 40% discount. You can beat the virtual queues in advance and buy yourself or a loved one a very special watch, perhaps for Christmas. And to put the cherry on top, every sale also kicks back some funds to the restoration and the maintenance of the actual aircraft. I should also mention one of the watches, the RJM04, is a limited edition. So if you want it, get it while it's available. I hope you found this second look at Soviet Spitfires interesting and that you are as, well, as excited as me at seeing another one of those World War II aircraft back in the sky. You know, any thoughts or feelings about this, put them down below. Looking forward to your comments. And as, as always, thank you very much for watching. And I'd also like to thank Rekwatches for sponsoring this episode. And of course, Peter Teichmann and Darren Hadar for their time and help as well. As always, have a great day and see you in the sky.